Hey guys, welcome to the video on colligative properties. This is based out of 13.5 in your textbook. So colligative properties are the properties that deal with the number of particles that is dissolved in a given mass of solvent. There are some physical properties of solutions that differ from those from the pure solvents. For example, pure water freezes at zero degrees Celsius, but aqueous solutions actually freeze at a lower temperature. This is what we're going to focus on in this video. So as I said, colligative properties depend on the number of solute particles. They do not depend on the identity of the solute particles, but rather the quantity or the concentration. It depends on the number of solute particles independent of the nature of the solute means it doesn't depend on what the solute is it only depends on how much solute you are putting in so molar mass size identity does not matter there are four colligative properties that we're going to look at in this video vapor pressure lowering boiling point elevation freezing point depression and osmotic pressure these first three we're going to focus on much more osmotic pressure we're just going to briefly touch on before we get into the colligative properties, we have to talk about a factor that we have to take into account whenever we focus on colligative properties and whenever we do calculations. This factor is called the Van Hoff factor. It's represented by a lowercase i. The Van Hoff factor is the number of particles that a solute breaks up into. The reason we have to know this is because colligative properties depend on the total concentration of solute particles whether they are ions or molecules. So what we need to look at is how many particles or ions each solute dissociates into. And so what we have to know is whether the solute is an electrolyte or a non-electrolyte. And if you remember, an electrolyte is simply a soluble salt that dissociates into ions. So you have to keep in mind those solubility rules that you memorized over the summer. Because if it's soluble, it's an electrolyte. It always has to be an ionic compound unless it's an acid or a base. Otherwise, it's an electrolyte, it dissociates into its ions. For example, we would expect sodium chloride to give rise to two moles of ions, okay? Because NaCl breaks apart into Na plus and Cl minus. So if we put in one mole of NaCl, we get one mole of Na+, plus, one mole of Cl-, minus, or two moles total. Now, if you actually look up the Van Hoff factor, you would actually find that NaCl is slightly below two, and that's because of the reassociation that occurs. Not all NaCl breaks down completely. You also have some that's reassociating, but we're just going to go along with the expected value. If we would have, let's say, aluminum nitrate. We have one mole of aluminum nitrate. That means that we would have one mole of Al3 plus and three moles of nitrate, giving us four moles total. What this means is if we have 0.1 molar of aluminum nitrate that we put in, that's actually 0.4 molar total of ions okay, because we have 0.1 and then it dissociates and we can use our uh, factor label and our mole ratios. Take a look at sucrose. Sucrose is a covalent compound. It's organic. It does not dissociate. It is a non-electrolyte. The only time it's an electrolyte is if it's ionic and it dissociates into its ions. So sucrose has a Van Hoff factor of 1. Now, getting back into colligative properties, the first one that we're going to focus on is vapor pressure lowering. If you remember, vapor pressure is the pressure that's exerted by the vapor when it's at equilibrium with a liquid in a closed system, like this picture down here. Okay, the vapor pressure is the pressure that exists above a liquid. Now, when we look at vapor pressure, again, it depends on the total concentration of the solute particles, not what solute you put in. So when we put a solute in, it has to be a non-volatile, which means it doesn't have a vapor pressure itself. Otherwise, then we'd have to worry about calculating two vapor pressures and it could get really complicated. So um, if we put a solute in, it actually reduces the ability of the solvent molecules to escape the liquid and to evaporate. So we have particles that are dissolved in solution. And in order for the solvent particles to escape, the solvent particles must collide and be in contact with the surface of the liquid. But the solute particles get in the way of the solvent trying to leave, which means there isn't as much solute up above, and then there's a lower vapor pressure. 
essentially the solute particles get in the way of the solvent that it's trying that's trying to evaporate. Okay, so the amount of vapor pressure lowering depends on the amount of solute. The more solute you have dissolved, the lower the vapor pressure is going to be. So as I said, because of the attraction between the solute and the solvent, the vapor pressure is lowered because it's harder for the solvent to escape. Um, the vapor pressure would be lowered more when we have more particles. For example, calcium chloride versus glucose. If we put calcium chloride into a beaker, that gives us three moles of ions versus glucose, which is covalent and stays as a molecule. So we have three to one. Calcium chloride is going to have more of an effect. Now, when we look at <clears throat> vapor pressure, the vapor pressure of a solvent is actually proportional to the concentration. And this is given to us mathematically by Raoult's law. Raoult's law says that the partial pressure of the vapor above the solution equals the mole fraction of the solvent times the vapor pressure of the pure solvent. When you see this, this looks like a degree sign. It's the not N-A-U-G-H-T, kind of like we did for standard conditions. This means of the pure solvent. So this is one of the times when you want to make sure that you have the vapor pressure of the solvent. And I, I told you what everything was down here. The vapor pressure lowering, okay, or the delta P, is actually directly proportional to the mole fraction of the solute. So if we wanted to find, if we wanted to find delta P, okay, the change in vapor pressure is actually the mole fraction of the solute times p naught of the solvent. So there's actually a little bit different if we wanted to find the actual delta p, but Raoult's law gives us a way to calculate um, the partial pressure of the solvent vapor when we have a solution. Now if you want more on Raoult's law, let's say you have a question on what if there's two components in the beaker. Then take a look at page 550 in your book. There's a section called A Closer Look that actually dives into um, two or more components in a container looking at vapor pressure. It dives into that much more. So then we have boiling point elevation and freezing point depression. So vapor pressure has an effect on boiling point. Remember that in order for something to boil, uh, the vapor pressure has to equal atmospheric pressure. So these solute-solvent interactions also have an effect on boiling point and freezing point. Now, freezing point depression is actually why we add antifreeze, which is actually ethylene glycol, to a car's radiator. Antifreeze lowers the freezing point of the solution. So you pour the solute in, it lowers the freezing point of uh, the solution, which the pure solvent was water, so it has to get much colder for that to freeze. The same is true of boiling point. The added solute when you add that antifreeze, it also raises the boiling point of the water in the car engine and it allows that engine to run at a much higher temperature. So boiling point elevation. As I said, since vapor pressures are lowered, that means that you're going to have a higher temperature in order to reach atmospheric pressure. So notice that the vapor pressure for the solution is actually lower than the pure solvent. So notice that it's lower, which means in order to hit atmospheric pressure, our temperature has to be higher. So our boiling point is actually raised. Now what you can actually do is ask somebody what they think or why they think you add salt to water. Because based on what we're talking about here, water, when you add salt to water, the salt is the solute. It raises the boiling point of the water. So it doesn't actually cook faster at all. Adding salt to water actually raises the boiling point. You only add salt to water just to flavor the water. It doesn't have it cook faster or at a lower temperature. All you're doing is actually raising the boiling point of the water. Now, down here at the bottom, I have this um, link for a help website, just one of Purdue's chemistry websites, so that you could actually take a look if you have questions on boiling point elevation at the molecular level. So going along with boiling point elevation, when you add a solute, a non-volatile solute, it lowers the vapor pressure, which raises the boiling point. And so since the solution has a lower vapor pressure than the pure solvent, higher temperature is required to get to atmospheric pressure, so it raises the boiling point. Now the change in boiling point can actually be calculated from this equation below. So a change in boiling point, which is delta Tb, is proportional to the concentration of the solute over here. So delta T is simply the 
temperature, the boiling point of the solution, minus the boiling point of the pure solvent. That's all that delta T means, right? It's the change in temperature. What happens from the pure solvent to the solution? Now in this formula, delta T equals I K M. I is that Van Hoff factor. So you have to think about your solute and how many particles or how many ions or molecules it breaks down into, if at all. KB is the molal boiling point constant. This is experimentally determined for each solvent. So you have or you will be given a table of the boiling point and freezing point constants. That's what you're going to use and it's based on each solute. And then the lowercase m is molality that we talked about calculating in the last video. Going along with boiling point, we have freezing point. So when a solution freezes, crystals must form. When a solute is added, the solute disrupts the formation of the crystals. Okay? Because when a solution freezes, crystals of the pure solvent are usually formed first. But the entire solution cannot freeze because the solute disrupts the formation of the crystals, which means you have to lower that temperature in order for all of the solute particles, the ions, the molecules to freeze as well. This colligative property is utilized actually in the winter when we put calcium chloride or, or a various salt on the roads because what that does when it snows, the calcium chloride actually lowers the freezing point of the water, which means it has to get significantly colder in order for that to freeze. That's why if it gets really, really cold and wind chills are extremely low, the salt on the road still doesn't work. That's because it's hit that low freezing point. Freezing point depression, something to make note of when it does freeze. As the solvent freezes, okay, the solute molecules aren't soluble in the solid phase which means as a solution freezes, the solution becomes more concentrated as it freezes because as the solvent freezes out, all you have now is more solute in less solvent. So that's, that's something to make note of. When we look at freezing point depression, we have delta Tf, a change in temperature of the freezing point. It equals negative I times Kf times M. Okay. Again, I is the Van Hoff factor, K is the molal freezing point depression constant, M is molality. Make sure your units cancel and you're left with what you need in the end. Now notice that TF, okay, if we actually move this negative to the other side, TF is negative because the solution freezes at a lower temperature, which means your delta T ends up being negative. Okay, so again, this lowers the vapor pressure and the triple point occurs at a lower pressure. So when I said you had that table of freezing point constants, this would be what you'd be given. Okay, this gives you the normal boiling point, so you can see of the pure solvent, gives you the boiling point constant, normal freezing point, freezing point constant. <clears throat> and so water, water you're gonna have to know. Okay, you're gonna have to know that water freezes at zero degrees and boils at 100. In class, I might make you rely on this table if you're given one of the one of the four after water. So this freezing point, uh, or excuse me, this phase diagram just shows what happens um, when vapor pressure is lowered, what happens to freezing point, and how the um, solution's freezing point is actually below the pure solvent's freezing point. So then finally we get into osmosis. You might remember a long time ago, maybe you don't. In the movie Osmosis Jones, where they're inside the body. That's always what I think of when I think of osmosis. So when it comes to osmosis, this is really dealing with more of the biology, but it is a colligative property that we look at. So in the body or in other systems, semi-permeable membranes permit passage of some components. So semi-permeable means some things are permitted, some things can get through. Sometimes they permit um, water, but not larger molecules or ions. Osmosis is simply the movement of a solvent from an area of low solute concentration to high solute concentration. So essentially what we're doing is we're trying to equalize concentration. If you have low solute, high solute, we need to move the solvent to where there's high solute to dissolve more of that. Um, however, in relation to the solvent, there would be movement from high solvent to low solvent. So you have to think about what you're focusing on. Are you focusing on the solute or the solvent?
This picture just shows you um, osmosis, shows you the net movement back and forth, um, and it shows you what happens um, with osmosis that we'll look at in the next slide. So osmotic pressure is actually the colligative property that we focus on that deals with osmosis. This is simply the pressure that's required to stop osmosis. Depends on the solution concentration. Osmotic pressure is represented by a capital PI, right? And it's equal to I times moles over volume times R times T. So this is pressure. It actually looks very, very similar to the ideal gas law, right? Pivner. PV equals NRT, um, except we have I in here as well, and we just use molarity. Um, so again, I is the Van Hoff factor, M is molarity, not molality, molarity. R is the ideal gas law constant. It's going to be the one that uses liters, probably liters and atmospheres. That's going to be the easiest, and T is going to be temperature. Now keep in mind, make sure your units uh, balance out or cancel out and you're left with what you need. We have different types of solutions when, when we look at osmosis. We can have an isotonic solution, which means that the solutions on both sides. When we look at osmosis, we always are focusing on two solutions because they're separated by a membrane. We can have an isotonic um, system, which means the solutions have identical osmotic pressure, okay? which means if it's isotonic, no osmosis will occur. Okay? They already have equal pressure. We can have hypotonic. A okay? hypo means low. So if a solution has a lower osmotic pressure than the other, it is hypotonic with respect to the other, uh, which means solvent will leave this solution and go to the other one. Um, hypertonic then uh, means high, so if a solution has a higher osmotic pressure, it is hypertonic with respect to the other. Okay? If it has higher pressure, solvent will enter this solution uh, to try to balance it out. Now there's some important applications of osmosis that deal with your body. So if you're interested in the human body um, or even in medicine, this is actually a great application of osmotic pressure. So red blood cells are semi-permeable. They let some things in, they let some things out, or they don't let some things in. So some things go in, some don't. The solution inside a red blood cell is called the intracellular solution, right? It's, it's inside the cell. Um, if a red blood cell is placed in a solution that is hypertonic relative to the solution, water actually moves out of the cell. So Here's when it's at equilibrium, it's isotonic, right? If it's put into a hypotonic, or excuse me, if it's put into a hypertonic, um, what actually happens is water moves out of the cell, causes it to shrivel up, and it, it causes what's called crenation, which is when the red blood cells shrivel. Um, however, if you put it into a hypotonic solution, water will enter the cell. And when water enters the cell, this could call this could cause hemolysis, which means the red blood cells going to expand, expand, and eventually rupture. So the important part of this osmotic pressure application is that people who need an IV are actually given nutrients directly into the veins rather than um, into the, um, or they're given the solution into the veins, but that solution must be isotonic with the red blood cell. So they're actually given, you know, they, they inject it into their arm, into the vein, and that solution has to be isotonic to prevent crenation or hemolysis.